Okay, so for the next 25 minutes or so, I'll talk about this new entity called double hit lymphoma. As we all know, the current classification and in fact our treatment strategies are all based on our hematopathology colleagues telling us what they see underneath the microscope. And with this, we have evolved into about a dozen broad categories and 60 unique clinical pathologic subtypes from which we decide what our treatment should be. However, the way that this pie is going to look in the future, I think, is significantly impacted by better biology and our understanding that hiding within any one pathology are a number of clinical and biological subsets. We've now known for over 15 years that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, for example, has at least two different subtypes, possibly three, based on gene expression profiling of approximately 20,000 genes. But I think if we look back at this, the other data that, I, that we can glean from this is that not only are these molecularly different in terms of gene expression, but they have unique pathogenetic mechanisms, and in fact, perhaps could be considered very different diseases. So for example, in the ABC subtype, subtype of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, B-cell receptor signaling is very, very important, tonic B-cell receptor signaling, whereas in the germinal center type of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, perhaps PI3 kinase signaling, either dependent or independent of B-cell receptor, may be more important. So as we learn about these biologic subtypes, we identify new targets and perhaps start to treat these as different diseases. However, cell of origin is a fantastic starting point, and it tells us quite a bit, and I know Professor Tilly will be covering this in his presentation. Just two comments I want to make about cell of origin as we go forward. The first is that if you look at germinal center diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which has a superior outcome, you notice that 20% of patients will relapse within the first year or so following diagnosis. And in contrast, those patients with ABC diffuse large B cell lymphoma, approximately 40 to 50 percent of these patients have long-term survival, suggesting that although cell of origin is very important prognostically, there's still heterogeneity hiding within that designation. So if we go back to the pie, I think that the cell of origin dichotomy is a very good starting point, but clearly not enough. There are other factors that we will talk about today, including double hit lymphoma and what I'm going to call double protein lymphoma, but arguably this is not the correct or perhaps the best term, and we can discuss that. What I find fascinating is that the vast majority of those patients with double hit lymphoma actually have a germinal center uh, phenotype, and those patients who have a double protein lymphoma, which I'll define as we go forward, have a non-germinal center phenotype. And how these particular designations interact, I think, is the subject of future investigation. And then the other comment I'll just make is that although these are just some ways to look at diffuse large B cell lymphoma, there's also a mutational landscape that's emerging, and Randy Gascoigne has very nicely summarized this in a recent Nature review. And I think, for me at least, when I look at any paper that includes patients with unselected diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I have to remember that there are a number of different biologic entities that are hiding within this, and this is important as we interpret the effects of any one therapy. So I'll start this in a little bit of a chronological story and say that this started with the observation about MYC rearrangements in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. As we know, MYC is the diagnostic abnormality, the rearrangement of 814 and 822 in Burkitt lymphoma. However, it's also clear that MYC can be rearranged in a number of other lymphomas. When it's rearranged in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it moves from being a diagnostic criteria to actually being a prognostic criteria and has a very poor outcome. So this very early study from uh, the Canadians looked back at patients who had a MYC rearrangement, either by cytogenetics or by FISH, that they could look in their archive samples, and very clearly showed here on the right-hand side that if the MYC rearrangement was present, that the, uh, both the progression-free and the overall survival was essentially cut in half. This has been shown again in the RCHOP era in a very nice paper looking at MYC rearrangements. And again, if you look at the left-hand curve, you can see that if the rearrangement is present, patients do not do as well. This is even independent or perhaps supplants uh, or adds to uh, the IPI. So those patients who have an IPI of uh, zero or one, called IPI low here, have the top arrow, and you can see that they don't do as well as those patients who don't have a MYC rearrangement with a low IPI. And similarly, if you have a high IPI and you have a MYC rearrangement, you have the, the very bottom line that's shown right over here. 
So what is the frequency? If this is such a poor adverse prognostic factor, how often do we expect to see MIC rearrangements in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma? Looking at series from across the world, you can see that MIC by itself is rearranged in somewhere between 10 to maybe 15 or 17 percent of patients. And as you can see on the very last column, this translates to an inferior outcome. Certainly none of us would like to see an overall survival of only 30 percent for our patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The question initially was, why is MIC rearrangement diagnostic in Burkitt lymphoma, but prognostic in non-Burkitt lymphoma? And a very elegant study from Lou Stout's lab showed that the reason lies in a completely different set of genes that are affected by MIC. Remembering that MIC is a transcription factor, and some could consider that the presence of this factor depends, or that the addition of this factor depends on what other genes are already abnormal, and that MIC will drive them. And so these heat maps really just show that the set of genes affected by MIC varies based on the histology. In addition, when MIC is rearranged in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, if you look at the box plots here all the way onto the right, you can see that molecular Burkitt lymphoma, which is the MBL there, has what's called MIC simple. It is just MIC that is rearranged, and there isn't this entirely complex set of genes that are altered. And in contrast, when you have a single hit lymphoma, which is MIC rearranged, or a double hit lymphoma, which we're going to talk about in a moment, the degree of genomic complexity goes up, again suggesting that MIC by itself is not the problem, but rather is perhaps associated with a number of other abnormalities. Which leads us to the next topic, which is that MIC rearrangement alone may not explain the poor prognosis of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma when it's present. It turns out that the combination of having this very strong, potent proliferation factor, which is MIC, combined with an anti-apoptotic factor, such as BCL2, leads to this phenomenon or this entity that we now call double-hit lymphoma. Uh, fortunately, the frequency of having both of these rearrangements in this entity is much less common uh, than MIC alone or even BCL2 alone. Uh, so looking for both a MIC and a BCL2 rearrangement, this now accounts for about 5 to 8 percent of unselected patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And one sort of caveat that I'm going to mention is that I am not, I don't have a slide showing patient characteristics of double hit lymphoma. And I'll tell you that the, the literature to me is very, very complicated in this area. Some would say that a high proliferation rate is predictive of double hit. Others would say that B-cell lymphoma unclassifiable is predictive or older age. And I think I think there's too much conflicting data, and at least at our center right now, we do test for MIC rearrangements and BCL2 rearrangements in all of our patients. But I do think that's a point of debate. When it comes to treatment, there are no prospective trials to date, with the exception of one abstract that was presented at ASH, and I will show you in just a moment. But there are a few retrospective series from which we can try to understand a little bit about the clinical management. The first is a single institution retrospective analysis from MD Anderson. And Dr. Yoki uh, presented this uh, at, at ASH and then recently had this published in the British Journal of Hematology. And I want to point out a couple of uh, factors. The first is if you look at the top left, the overall survival and event-free survival is not what you expect for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The top curve on the right looks at the different histologies where they found both uh, BCL2 and MIC rearranged. And other than some of the transformed lymphomas, for unexpected reasons in my mind at least, had a much better outcome, even if there was a double hit present, the rest of them have a very poor outcome. There was a small impact of stage, again, with state, if you look at the bottom left hand, that those patients who had stage one disease did very, very well, but anybody who had more than that did not do well. And I think perhaps the most sobering part of this slide is the one on the bottom right, showing that even young patients had as poor of an outcome as those who were older. They also evaluated the different regimens that had been given. And again, there's the caveat of all of the different retrospective analyses have. But they looked at a variety of intensive regimens, uh, including our hyper cvad which was developed at MD Anderson, our EPOC, uh, and compared it to our CHOP, uh, as well as several other uh, aggressive regimens. And the bottom line, at least here, is that our CHOP has a very, very ineffective uh, impact on this disease. And in this, again, retrospective series, it seems that dose-adjusted EPOC-R might have a slight advantage. 
but I'll have you focus on the bottom two slides here, which look at the impact of a complete response, uh, particularly as it relates to consolidative transplant. I think at least at our center and many other places in the states, for those patients with double hit lymphomas, we have started to consider consolidative autologous transplant. And what the bottom curve on the left shows, that independent of whether or not patients received a stem cell transplant, uh, if they had a CR, they seemed to do better than those patients who did not have a CR. And again, if you look over onto the uh, right side on the bottom, there was no difference in overall survival by the addition of transplant. So again, this remains a very murky area. Similarly, Adam Petrich from Northwestern, along with a number of different centers, put together a series of patients with double hit lymphomas as defined by FISH and cytogenetics. This is a larger, multi-center uh, publication. This is 311 patients. And again, they had a several different aims. One was to look at the different regimens and to say, would a more intensive regimen overcome the negative uh, significance of having this dual rearrangement? And again, what they found, and this is the bottom line here, which is that RCHOP was inferior to intensive treatment, but they didn't have the power to really comment on which one of these regimens may fall out. Although I will comment that dose-adjusted EPOC-R, again, seems to be a reasonable option. They, too, looked at the impact of consolidative transplant, which was offered only to a minority of patients. And it turns out that if uh, patients had a CR to their initial chemotherapy, there was no statistically signif significant difference uh, whether or not they had a consolidative auto. So although it's, I will say that although it's not statistically significant, I don't like how these two curves look very different. And certainly, I think it, it, it adds to the fact that whether or not to perform an autologous transplant consolidation remains remains unclear, but they did not find statistically significant advantage if patients were in a complete remission. And then lastly, there is the Ohio State retrospective experience, which again did a multivariable analysis of double hit lymphoma and found that those patients who had a CR to their induction therapy had a much superior outcome independent of transplant. And so to me, what these three retrospective analyses uh, suggest is that we really do have to focus on the upfront treatment of these patients and make CR the goal. And whether or not we add a consolidative transplant, I think, is a second, perhaps smaller question. But right now, it's the initial therapy that seems to make the most difference. The only prospective data in this space that has been presented was presented at ASH by Kieran Dunleavy, and it's from the NCI. They developed a phase two multi-center trial of dose-adjusted EPOC-R for those patients with MIC rearranged diffuse large or lymphomas in general. They did not restrict this to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. They did not restrict this to double hit. So many of these are MIC rearranged without the additional BCL2 rearrangement, and the study is small with only 50 patients, and the follow-up is very short. However, similar to some of the other publications from the NCI, I think the shape of these curves is very, very interesting. And you can see that although we lose some patients in the first uh, few months, that there appears to be a plateau. Now, this needs a lot more follow-up, but certainly suggests that dose-adjusted EPOC-R could be a backbone uh, upon which to build further trials. The other issue that I think is a theme is this very last slide on the right, showing that if BCL2 is overexpressed, in addition to having a MIC rearrangement, those patients did much worse than those patients who did not have the BCL2 by protein, again suggesting that there is some cooperation in terms of poor prognosis that these two factors have. Now, what's new over the last year or couple of years is the availability, the commercial availability, of an immunohistochemical stain against MYC. For many years, the only way to evaluate for the presence of MYC was with the rearrangement using FISH, looking at gain of copy number, looking at rearrangement, or cytogenetics. However, now that we have a way to look at this by protein overexpression, it turns out that a significant portion of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma will have this intracellular stain. And it's not always predicted, again, by the proliferation rate or the morphology itself. In addition, the relative frequency of MYC and BCL2 by immunohistochemistry is significantly higher than it is if you look at either one alone or if you look at them by MYC rearrangement. So for example, MYC is rearranged, as we said, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of unselected diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients. But if you use this new stain 
all of a sudden you see that around a third of patients, or perhaps even more if you look at the MD Anderson publication on the bottom, will have MYC overexpressed by protein. And the definition of overexpression is usually 40% or higher. Similarly, if you look at BCL2 rearrangements, this occurs variably in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We've known this for decades. But if you look by protein, this is much, much higher. And in fact, when you look at the two together, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma will have double protein expression. So here I will just say that I'm going to use the term DPL, and uh, this is not an official term. It's just a term that we have started to use within our cooperative groups. And this is uh, to, to remind you that the current definition per the WHO for double hit lymphoma refers to cytogenetic or fish abnormalities. And when I say double protein lymphoma, I'm referring to immunohistochemical uh, overexpression of these proteins. And, uh, the WHO talks about MYC and BCL6 as a different type of double hit lymphoma, or when all three are present as a triple hit lymphoma, and there is almost no data on the protein overexpression of BCL6 with MYC, and I will not address that for the remainder of the talk. So what happens if you have these two proteins overexpressed? Is it the same as double hit lymphoma? Is it a different entity or not? Well, if we take a look at the literature, I think we see some common themes. The first is that the addition of MYC, BCL2 to MYC overexpression, even by protein, adds in terms of negative prognosis. So if we look at this very nice paper that looked at four different groups of patients, uh, the top line is patients who had neither MYC nor BCL2 overexpressed by protein, okay, by immunohistochemistry, either BCL2 alone, MYC alone, or both. And what you can see from the bottom line is that for both overall survival and event-free survival, those patients who had both proteins overexpressed, as these authors defined it, did not do very well. This very large paper that includes over 1,000 patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma also evaluated double hit and double protein lymphoma. The top two curves look at the overall survival and progression-free survival of classic double hit by cytogenetics, and we can see that those curves go down very quickly, and they go down almost to zero. On the bottom, you can see what happens when they just looked at those patients who have double protein lymphoma without underlying double hit, okay? And here, although these curves are not as dismal as the double hit lymphomas, I would not be happy with a 30% overall expected survival for my patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The other interesting aspect is that I started out mentioning cell of origin, and the question then becomes, what is the relationship between double protein lymphoma and cell of origin? And although this is a complicated table, which I think actually has a lot of interesting information, I just want to highlight three things when it comes to cell of origin. The first, as has been previously established, the vast majority of patients who have double hit with cytogenetic rearrangement have a germinal center phenotype. On the other hand, 63% of patients with double protein lymphoma have a non-germinal center phenotype, suggesting that there is some interaction between cell of origin and whether or not these proteins are overexpressed. In addition, those patients with double protein lymphoma are much older than the average age of patients who have diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And I think this goes along. ABC diffuse large B-cell lymphoma occurs more commonly in elderly, and double protein lymphoma, which is more common in ABC, also occurs in, in the elderly. But I think this has a lot of therapeutic implications, especially if we start to talk about transplant and other more aggressive regimens. Kind of hitting home that this uh, double protein expression may be somehow linked to uh, the cell of origin in a very uh, unique way by the cell of origin is that depending on whether or not you have a, an ABC or a germinal center diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the set of genes that are expressed in the presence of double protein are very different. And again, this plenary paper in blood looked at over 200 genes. They actually looked at many, many more, but they found 208 genes that were differentially expressed, again suggesting perhaps a unique biology and a different pathogenesis. And then also coming back to the IPI, which is our, our very, very powerful clinical tool, if we look at double protein, uh, those patients who have a low IPI, which is the top light blue uh, line, for both overall and progression-free survival, if they don't have the double protein, the low IPI, they have an excellent outcome. On the other hand, if they do have the double protein, 
all of a sudden, the IPI does not seem to matter, and those bottom three curves seem to cluster very closely together. So what about treatment? Well, there is no data. Uh, this is all retrospective. Um, there's no prospective data at all. But just to, again, emphasize that double protein lymphoma does not do well with RCHOP is this very nice paper looking at what they call double hit score. So it's DHS in this particular paper. But what they did is they had 193 patients in their retrospective review with de novo diffuse large B-cell lymphoma who received RCHOP. All patients underwent FISH and immunohistochemistry for MYC and BCL2, which gave them a score of zero, neither one of those proteins overexpressed, one if they had any one of them, or two if they had both. And what you can see is that, again, there is a cooperation. Those patients who had zero or one of those proteins overexpressed had the top line over there. And those patients who had both uh, MYC and BCL2 have the bottom line there. And again, what this suggests to me is that RCHOP although we don't know what to replace it with, is probably not the best if we find that this is present. And then again, just sort of showing the relative frequencies and perhaps emphasizing that this is a group worthy of individual study is that FISH shows that 6% of this group had double hit lymphoma, which reflects what has previously been published, and one third of patients had this double hit score of two. Again, suggesting that up to a third of our patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma may fall into this group. So when it comes to clinical management, um, I think right now it's all a matter of debate. And you know, this is really an area where new data is needed. All of the data, with the exception of that one abstract, is retrospective. And I think all we know so far is that an intensive regimen may be superior and that the role of consolidative transplant is unknown. When it comes to double protein lymphoma, I think we have to look Many places don't do MYC by immunohistochemistry, and I think if you look, you're going to find it. We routinely do BCL2, but we have now started to do uh, MYC as well. And not that we know what to do, but at least in our institution, we have a clinical trial adding lenalidomide to dose-adjusted EPOC-R in a phase one, phase two study. Overall, I think at least uh, I'm part of the NCI steering committee, and in our cooperative groups at least, we are looking at the dose-adjusted EPOC-R as a backbone uh, for future trials but it's not really clear if this is the best backbone or not or if there are other alternatives. In addition, it may make sense to start looking at the pathogenesis. As we said, there are different uh, pathways that are abnormal in these different subsets, and perhaps this will identify some new targets. So uh, to summarize, uh, at this point in the treatment of, I have to make that 2015, sorry, treatment of DHL and DPL in 2015, we don't know the initial treatment. We don't know, for example, if double hit and double protein lymphoma should be approached similarly or not. And in fact, I think there are three groups. There are those who have double hit lymphoma, those who have double protein lymphoma with double hit, and those who have double protein alone. And whether or not these three groups can be combined in a study, if you have to stratify for them, I think are all areas of debate. And although I put does cell of origin matter, I, I absolutely think cell of origin matters. But the question is whether or not it impacts significantly how we address patients with DHL and DPL. And then in terms of autologous stem cell transplant for consolidation, again, we consider this for our patients. And it's ironic. We almost always offer it when they're in a CR, uh, which may be counterintuitive so, since those are the patients who may do the best. And allo transplant I did not cover, but if somebody is young enough, this is certainly something we would offer them either in first or second remission. And then the last bullet point, um, I actually took out those slides. I wasn't sure if I'd have enough time. But uh, a sub-analysis of the CORAL study, and Christian Gesselbrecht uh, had published this, is that autologous transplant as a salvage approach for those patients with double hit lymphoma is not particularly effective. And so, you know, I think, again, our frontline therapy has to be the best therapy, and it has to move those curves up if we are to make an impact. So with that, I'll show you a picture of Chicago in the summer. Now, you never get to see it in the summer unless you come to ASCO. And this down here on the bottom is the University of Chicago. Right here, that's our new hospital. President Obama lives somewhere around here when he's in Chicago. And then you can see the skyline up north. Thank you very much.